we will be picking back up on chapter 22 of Bitten, The Secret History of Lyme Disease and Biological Weapons by Chris Newby. Red Velvet Mines, Sale Austria, 1974. The oil from the Red Velvet Mine, Trombidium Grand Grandissimum, considered and as an aphrodisiac in India, has reportedly been sold on the black market to agents in the Ayurvedic medicine industry for 1,500 to 2,000 rupees per kilogram, rare breed of insects in huge demand, the Hindu, June 24th, 2015. On October 12, 1974, Willie, who had recently been promoted to head of the Rickettsial Disease Section at Rocky Mountain Lab, joined 200 mite and tick researchers from 36 countries in Salfeldin, Sal, Salfeldin, Salfeldin, Austria, a mountain resort town southwest of Salzburg. He was invited to present on the current state status of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the United States as at the International Congress of Acarology. Willie brought his 8mm camera and the resulting edited film allows the viewer to see through his eyes. From the window of a train, he filmed multicolored chalets nested in the hollows of verdant valleys he showed autobahn traffic stopped by wandering mocha colored dairy cows wearing bells around their necks he filmed men wearing lederhosen marching through narrow city streets and a church steeple set against soaring white tipped limestone alps at the social hour before the conference began, Willie stood apart from the attendees, filming them from a high berm above the parking lot. Then he filmed at ground level. There were a few representatives from the Soviet Union and other communist bloc countries attending. Each attendee wore a name tag adorned with a photo of something that looked like an obese spider covered in plush red fuzz. It was a red velvet mite, regarded by... Acarologists as the most romantic of the arachnids. To attract females, the male of the species builds an elaborate love garden of plants and sticks spattered with sticky globules of sperm. He then lays down a silken path from his garden in an area frequented by females. When one approaches, the male begins performing an eight legged dance, a tarantula of sorts to lure her down the path to his sperm-filled garden. This event should have been a high point in Willie's career. He had just received an award from the director of the NIH and had been invited to present his research at this international congress. But there were problems at home. His expertise in developing biological weapons honed over 20 years was now obsolete and his best work was classified, never to be published. Also, his NIH budget had been reduced. On top of that, Dale's health continued to deteriorate. She'd just returned from weeks of depression treatments at a hospital in Portland, Oregon. Their boys, now 17 and 19 years old, were adding to Willie's money worries, were requiring college tuition, new cars, and orthodontic work. In the photos taken at the Austrian conference, Willie looks unhappy. He often sat apart from others, staring off into the distance. Years later, he described the conference to his son Carl, saying, I had never felt so lonely in my life. The last scene of Willie's film featured two young female archaeologists, one from Austria and the other from Slovakia, getting into a Volkswagen bug and waving goodbye. As Willie stood on the path next to the road, his camera lingered on the car as the beautiful scientists drove away. On his way back to Montana, Willie stopped by Basil to see his mother and to open a new Swiss bank account. According to the deposit slip, he left the passbook with the banker rather than bringing it home. 
Willie had no rich relatives or pending inheritances at that time. It appeared that something was weighing heavily on his mind around the time of the 1974 Congress, but when he returned home, his money problems seemed to have disappeared. After 1974, he, brought two car he bought two cars and began building an addition onto his house. He also started teaching German at the local library and began having a, an affair with one of his students, a younger woman. His son Carl discovered the affair and the news eventually got back to Dale. Without the protection of her imaginary iron cross, she fell into a dark depression. Chapter 23, Wildfire, Long Island and Lyme, Connecticut, 1975, Potential Epidemiolo Potential epidemiological clues to deliberate epidemic. Clue number one, a highly unusual event with a large number of casualties. Clue number two, highly, higher morbidity or mortality than is expected. Clue number three, uncommon disease. Clue number four, point source outbreak. Clue number five, multiple epidemics. Z.F. Dembeck et al., discernment between deliberate and natural infectious disease outbreaks. In 1975, Hugh Carey, the 51st governor of New York State, brought a historic Queen Anne Victorian on Shelter Island, a tiny isle nestled between the north and south forks of Long Island. His four-story estate, adorned with scalloped edged cedar shingles and white trim, sat on a bluff overlooking the Peconic River. In a neighborhood designed by the father of landscape architecture, Frederick Law Olmsted, and town planner Robert Morris Copeland, this was to be his family's summer home, and recent media coverage of spotted fever deaths concerned him. To Carey, an old-school Irish-American politician, the thought of sharing his new estate with disease-carrying ticks was unacceptable. So Carey launched a public campaign against tick-borne diseases and put the commissioner of New York State Department of Health, Robert Whalen, in charge. Whalen, in turn, handed the assignment off to a 30-year-old Department of Health employee, George Benak, Ph.D. Benak was born in Havana, Cuba, and had an amiable smile and thick, wavy auburn hair. When he was 16, he and his family left Cuba after the 1962 communist takeover and settled in New Jersey. Having been interested in tropical diseases and biting things from, a, er, from an early age, he majored in the biological sciences at Uppsala College in New Jersey and then obtained a PhD in parasitology and entomology at Rutgers University. The big break in his career came with the call to action from Governor Carey. Just as Benak was finishing up a postdoctoral fellowship with Willie, the commissioner gave Benak $35,000 for the Spotted Fever Project, which covered his salary, a lab technician, and a tick collector. He was told that he had a month to get the tick situation under control, while Benak or coordinated the lab work on the mainland, he sent his assistant to Shelter Island to drag for ticks. Before long, Binnock learned that Rocky Mountain spotted fever wasn't, only, wasn't the only potential fatal disease on Long Island. The first case of human babesiosis, a, a supposedly rare malaria-like protozoan infection, was found on nearby Nantucket in 1968. By 1979, within a focused area, there were 13 babesiosis cases on Nantucket, one on Martha's Vineyard, and three on Shelter Island. On October 13, 1977, the Boston Globe wrote, despite the small number, this outbreak continues the world's largest known cluster of babesiosis cases. The researchers conducting the Babesia investigation Andrew Spielman from Harvard University and George Healy from the CDC's Bureau of Tropical Diseases were stumped as to why writing in a journal article we have no satisfactory explanation for the clustering of cases on Nantucket in 1975 and 1976. 
A month later, the health commissioner called Benak to get an update on his tick project. Benak told him he was just getting started, and the commissioner replied, Do you know what it's like to have a governor on your ass? Benak reached out to Willie for help. We have just recorded our first case of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever for 1976. A woman from Lloyd Neck, he wrote, This case has an onset of illness a full month earlier than the earliest 1975 case. There was an air of desperation in the handwritten note at the bottom of the typed letter. P.S. Please note I am not taking no for an answer. This epidemic of rickettsia disease was a real problem, said Benach in 2018. Some had rickettsia rickettsi, some were dying of it. What became apparent was that there was a huge constellation of rickettsia entities in these ticks, and we just didn't know how they worked. Together, he and Willie analyzed the data and then published a journal article, Changing Patterns in the Incident incidents of rocky mountain spotted fever on long island 1971 through 1976 it reported that rmsf was sufficiently severe in 89 cases 72 percent to require hospitalization and supportive care with an average uncompl uncomplicated hospital stay of eight days eight deaths 6.4 percent of cases were reported Rickettsia testing for this study was done at Long Island hospitals and at New York State and Nassau, Nassau County Health Departments. The lab personnel weren't Rickettsia experts and they used a not that accurate antibody test. The Wheel Felix ag agglutination test was Patient sera, i.e. blood samples with the red and white cells removed. In their Spotted Fever article, Willie and Banach explained in their discussion section the observations that they believed might turn out to be important later. There were two types of rickettsia-like organisms encountered in ticks collected by physicians and in hospitals. One was an oval organism that lit up when exposed to Rickettsia rickettsi fluorescent antibody tests. The other looked very different, about four times longer and shaped like a skinny link sausage. It didn't react to spotted fever tests. Willie thought the microbes looked like Rickettsia montana, a non-disease causing cousin of Rickettsia rickettsi. The spotted fever outbreak on Long Island was serious enough that the Suffolk County Health Commissioner called the CDC director for advice. The director assigned the case to an Epidemic Intelligence Service EIS officer at the Division of Viral Diseases as rickettsia, rickettsias were classified as viruses at the time. Epidemic Intelligence Services is the disease detective arm of the CDC found in 1951 as an early warning system for biological warfare and man-made epidemics. Fellows accepted into this very competitive postdoctoral training program work for two years in the field, investigating outbreaks, identifying cases, and implementing control measures. In looking at Long Island outbreaks, the EIS officer on the case thought it strange that only 40% of the, the spotted fever patients had noticed a tick bite in an internal memo. He and his co-authors offered one possible explanation, another method of trans transmission around a house could be the aerosolization of rickettsia through crushing ticks while de-ticking animals. Because they thought they were dealing only with dog ticks, ticks whose tiny larvae rarely bite humans, they added another possible explanation. Larval ticks may be responsible for cases not associated with known tick bites since their small size and abbreviated bitings, biting times may allow them to escape attention. On the other side of the island sound, about 20 miles from Shelter Island, in a heavily wooded area around Lyme, Connecticut, another puzzling disease outbreak was occurring. This disease first reached national attention after it was featured on page one 
of the New York Times on January 17, 1976. The teaser paragraph for the story read, In the last year or two, teenagers and younger children in adjoining cases... In adjoining Connecticut towns have been stricken with a painful ailment that affects joints. The cases seemed unrelated, but as dozens of others occurred all within the ad adjacent townships of Lyme, Old Lyme, and East Haddam, word of a mysterious new disease spread, two mothers of afflicted children acting separately telephoned to the Connecticut State Department of Health in Hartford. Their calls set in motion a scientific detective process that turned the fears of hysterical mothers into medical history. Experts on arthritis at Yale University School of Medicine, after months of study, now believe that they are on the trail of a previously unknown disease, which they call Lyme arthritis. Shortly after, the Star tabloid ran the story, Mysterious Illness Cripples Victims in Three Towns. Connecticut's Department of he Public Health realized that things were getting out of control and needed to do something. It was Connecticut's chief epidemiolog epidemiologist, David Snydem, Snydman, Snydman, a 29-year-old physician on loan from the CDC's EIS, who took the first phone call from Polly Murray, a mother in the township of Lyme, who had assembled detailed medical histories on her chronically ill neighbors. He thought her data he thought her data credible, so he agreed to investigate. He called a friend a friend to help, Alan Steary, a 33-year-old Yale University rheumatology fellow. Steary had a medical degree from Columbia University and had moved to Yale four months before after a two-year stint with the EIS. He began assisting Snydman in gathering clinical data from the 39 children and 12 adults with the mystery disease. Their first step was to develop, to develop a definition of the disease based on its symptoms. The common denominator among their patient cohort was an intermittent swelling of joints, what appeared to be a novel type of arth arthritis, the second most prevalent symptom noted in about 20% of the cases was an expanding red bull bullseye rash. The researchers also noted flu-like symptoms, malaise, fatigue, chills, fever, headache, stiff neck, backache, muscle aches, and occasionally cardiac and neurological problems. And because the cases were clustered in a tight geographic area, and because most patients fell ill in the summer or early fall, the two researchers researchers hypothesized that the disease might be spread by a cluster of infected ticks. Next, the Yale team screened ticks for common bacteria, including the spotted fever rickettsia, but no strong evidence of cause emerged. They also worked with the Yale Ar Ar Arbovirus Research Unit, which maintained a collection of virus samples from around the world. After four years of screening patient and tick samples for viruses, they turned up nothing. At his wit's end, Steary contacted Willie for help, but it wasn't Willie return but it wasn't until Willie returned from an eight month tick collecting trip in Switzerland that he began screening samples for Rickettsia. Looking at the situation with twenty twenty hindsight, only sees that there was something out of the ordinary going along the New England coast beginning in 1968. Cape Cod and Long Island areas had been hit by unusual spotted fever rickettsia cases that couldn't be de detected by conventional tests. Nantucket was ground zero for the first case of human babesiosis east of the Mississippi. 
and off the coast of Long Island around Lyme, Connecticut, a cluster of people were suffering from a disease that caused joint inflammation and bullseye rashes. In sort, there were multiple virulo virulent uncommon diseases in a small area, all transmitted by ticks. Investigations into these outbreaks were fragmented between the public health departments of four states. The CDC, Rocky Mountain Lab, Yale, Harvard, and Stony Brook University on Long, Long Island, and because of this coordination, suffered. Pam Weintraub, author of Cure Unknown, lays some of the blame for the slow pace of the investigation at the feet of, of the Yale team, and in her book she writes, not only did the Yale researchers view a multi-system illness through a prism of rheumatology, they also failed to factor in a hundred years of research from Europe, including descriptions of rash, the tick vector, the neurological complications, the curative power of penicillin, and even, sus even suspicion that a spirochete was at the root. The government entity with access to all the outbreak information that is the big picture was the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the very organization tasked with, with protecting us from unnatural epidemics, but researchers there were strangely silent. Nowhere was there a public discussion of the epidemiological clues in the unnatural hotspot for atypical spotted fever rickettsia on Long Island, for rare cases of human babesiosis, or for the soon-to-be-discovered virulent spirochete. This was a point source outbreak of multiple uncommon diseases, all transmitted by ticks and causing chronic inca incapacitation. The question was, what had caused it? 20, chapter 24, The Swiss Agent. Nekuchatal, Switzerland, 1978. Our own scientists have not been asleep in their laboratories. They have developed a new virus and rickettsia strains against which the world has no immunity. Jack Anderson, Washington Exposé. Three men with trouser legs tucked up into their socks walked along a grassy border between dense woodlands and a field. Each held a wooden pole attached to a white cloth flag that dragged along the ground. In the distance, they could see Lake ne Nekutal. Lake, I, I can't say that word. N-E-U-C-H-A with a weird thing above it, T-E-L. Nekutal, near the Swiss-French border. The lake was surrounded by red roofed houses, made mostly of stone and stucco, many with colorful shutters, and window planter boxes overflowing with red geraniums. geraniums. Periodically, one of the men would squat down and closely examine the surface of the flag, pull out a pair of tweezers, and place tiny ticks, some no bigger than a poppy seed, into a glass vial. By the fall of 1978, three men, Willie, a postdoctoral student, and Professor Andre Ash Ashilman from the University of Nekutau, an old friend and classmate of Willie's from the Swiss Tropical Institute, had been working five, five months, six to seven days a week to collect 4,000 ticks so they could be screened for rickettsia. According to the NIH annual report, Willie's Nekutial trip was a 10-month government-funded work-study program to investigate if rickettsia, possibly Q fever, was making Swiss agent goat herds ill. But why would the NIH send its top rickettsia expert to help Swiss goat herds while American citizens were dying of a spotted fever rickettsia at home? Dale Bergdorfer started, stared out the window of a tiny apartment on the other side of Lake Nukatau. The late afternoon sun cast a yellow light on the cheap, dusty furnishings. Earlier in the day, she'd gone to the grocery store, finished reading a book, 
and walked to the mailbox four times to see if a letter had arrived from her sons back in Montana. Her French was coming back slowly, but it was still hard to have real conversation to have a real conversation with anyone. Now she was waiting for Willie to come home. He had left at 7.30 that morning to collect ticks. She knew that he, if he circled back to the lab before coming home, it would be dark before she saw him. She finally gave up waiting and sat down at the kitchen table to write a letter to her sons, now 21 and 23. She wrote with a hard ballpoint pen in a tight, flat cursive so narrow and faint that it could hardly, hardly be read with the naked eye. I haven't been feeling very well the last couple of days, but I'm taking some medicine, so I should be on the up and up, she wrote. Willie loved field work back in Switzerland, but it had been a stressful trip. The weather was unseasonably cold and drizzly. He had brought Dale along because he was worried about leaving her alone after her m mother's death. But he could see that with her sitting alone in the apartment all day, she was slipping into a state of melancholy. There was also problems back in Hamilton. Willie had received an important IRS notification and a tenant of theirs had skipped town without paying rent. To make things worse, Dale received a telegram saying that her brother had died of a heart attack. The news pusher... The news pushed her over the edge, and Willie had to check into her Necotal Hospital and check her into the Necotal Hospital. He contacted the, the NIH to notify them that he and Dale would have to return home early, shortening this European trip by two months. Dale required heavy sedation just to endure the flight home. When they got to Hamilton, Willie checked her into the same mental hospital. Driving straight back into his work at the lab, he began by analyzing the hundreds of Ixodos Rechinus tick samples he brought home from Switzerland, searching for what he searching for what was making the goat herd sick. God Jesus. He and the Swiss team found three microbes never before seen in this, tick, in this species of tick. An unidentified spotted fever rickettsia, a whip-tailed cattle protozoan similar to Babesia called Tyropanosoma thieleri, th 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 and the infectious larval stage of a parasitic deer worm, Dip, dip, dip it. Dipetal, dipetal, dipet, dipetalom, damn, D I P E T A L O N E M A, dipetalonima, dipet. I said it once. That's it. Rug, rugosi. Rugosi Cauda. Willie sat at his microscope late into the night, snipping off tick legs and letting drops of their hemolyph fall into a glass slide. Mixing the drops with a strain that would make the rickettsia glass rickettsia grow under a dark field microscope. The dissecting and dissecting tick parts to see where the rickettsia hid inside the tick. Most established rickettsia evolve over time to find specific, specific, most established rickettsia evolve over time to find species specific competition, free niches within a tick. But these rickettsia were everywhere, shimmering stars in Willie's microscope galaxy. They floated in the tick's main body cavity, in the cell cytoplasm and nuclei, in the ovaries and in all stages of tick sperm. It was worrisome. If the new organism could be transmitted from tick eggs to the thousands of newly hatched larvae, it would spread more rapidly into the ecosystem than most tick-borne diseases. Under a higher magnification, Willie saw that the rickettsia existed in two form factors, a two cells 
at a two cells fused together, diplococcus form a sausage-like rod form. Both looked exactly like a newly discovered rickettsia he found on Long Island. Willie began infecting lab animals with Swiss rickettsia, and none of them got sick. But when he infected wild-type male meadow voles, a short-tailed species in the mouse family, they all came down with an infection of their testicular membrane sacs. On December 3rd, 1978, Willie nicknamed the new rickettsia from Switzerland the Swiss agent and wrote to Achilman, the organism is a bona fide rickettsia of the spotted fever group, but quite different from rickettsia rickettsi are Sibirica, R. Slovaka, and R. Cor Conori. He added, referring to the most virulent rickettsia, he developed a fluorescent antibody test so that he could rapidly detect infected ticks, lab animals, or humans. First, he isolated a unique identifying molecule from the surface of the microbe labeled as antigen C9P9 and mass produced it in a flask filled with a growth medium. Why? Antigens are the bad guys to an immune system and antibodies are essentially the beat cops on the lookout for them. When antibodies bump into an invading germ surface antigen, they bind to it ex essentially placing a most wanted poster on it. They also send out a bio biochemical all points bulletin to all parts of the body with, an inst with instructions to deploy the germ. Next he smeared the C9P9 antigen on a microscope slide and added a drop of animal's body bodily fluids that had been mixed with a fluorescent dye. If the animal had recently been exposed to the germ, there would be antibodies that recognized C9P9 as an invader, and the dyed antibodies attached to the C9P9 antigens would glow like little neon lights under the ultraviolet illumination. That's how Willie would know that the animal had been infected. On April 12, 1979, he began testing Lyme patients' blood samples against the European Swiss agent antigen, known disease causing rickettsia. The blood samples reacted strongly only to a Swiss agent antigen. This meant that the rickettsia from Switzerland and Long Island might be one and the same species or perhaps closely related. With the discovery of the Lyme spirochete still two years away, Willie kept pursuing a hypothesis that the Lyme outbreak was caused by the same organism that was making the Swiss goat herd sick. By August 1980, he was confident enough to he was confident enough with his experiments to share the test results with the east with the East Coast investigators working on the disease outbreaks. John Anderson and Lou Marginelli from the from the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station. George Binnock from New York State Department of Health, and Alan Steer from Yale University. In his lab notes, he referred to Swiss, Swiss Agent USA as R. Montana like rickettsia organism, or the East Side Agent. More blood and ticks were tested during the fall to make absolutely sure this was the microbial culprit. I am excited to pursue further the possibility of a rickettsia etiology of Lyme disease, Alan Steer wrote. Steer, Alan Steer wrote to Rocky Mountain Labs director Robert N. Phillip on November 8, 1979 during the first quarter of 1980. The thrill of discovering a new disease started creeping into their correspondence. If it was true that the American Swiss agent caused the Lyme outbreak, They'd go into the medical history books. Their finding would probably lead to tenure track positions at a major university and a steady flow of research grants. They might even have a shot at a Nobel Prize. 
On January 3rd, Willie wrote to Ashilman about testing he'd done on the Lyme arthritis patients. I have done some preliminary serology with a sera from patients and have found very strong react reaction agents. Reactions agents. Oh, no. I have done some preliminary serology with sera from patients and I have found very strong reactions against the Swiss agent. In February, his phone log read, Steery patient Sarah tested again, still very positive for Swiss agent. In March, he wrote to Anderson and Steer again, most specimens, with a few exceptions, reacted only against antigens prepared from the Swiss agent. In short, the disease clusters in Connecticut and Long Island seemed to have been caused by Swiss agent USA. Then, in April, the Swiss agent USA Rickettsia vanished. It was never again mentioned in, talk, in talks, letters, interviews, or journal articles. The only clue to its demise was a cryptic note from Steery to Willie that read, As mentioned in our telephone conversation, enclosed are the de decoded results of serological tests against various Rickettsia. I appreciated the chance to talk with you yesterday about the future direction for this work. I agree that any plans for manuscript, manuscript writing are currently premature. I would not want anything in print that you would not find convincing. Reading between the lines, it appears that Willie told Siri and Marganelli, Magn Magnarelli that the Swiss agent testing was unreliable. Benach recalls that Willie told him that he thought he Willie told him that he thought the new Rickettsia was a harmless symbiont symbiont that didn't cause disease. And about two years later, Willie announced that a spirochete was the causative agent of Lyme disease. Case closed. There is, without a doubt, something suspicious about the sudden disappearance of the Swiss agent USA from all correspondence. None of the living researchers involved in the Swiss agent discovery seem to recall or know why exactly it fell off the radar. Its absence from the scientific literature is equivalent to the missing 18 and a half minutes from, Nix from Nixon's White House tapes, and it leaves us with an important question. Why? A note from a lab technician confirming that Willie had found spirochetes, Wolbachia, an East Side agent, aka Swiss agent, USA Rickettsia, Babesia, and Microfilaria worms in the Lyme outbreak ticks. We'll, we'll stop it right there for today. Pick this up tomorrow, possibly.